Good morning, everyone who just joined us. We are going to give it just a minute or so to let a few more folks through the waiting room and um, we'll get going. So just give us a minute or two, okay? Hi, Delegate Dean. Thank you for joining us. I'm having technical having technical issues this morning. I might be in and out. The internet's going out here at the office. All right. It is 931, um, and folks are still joining from the waiting room. Um, I'm just going to give it one more minute to everyone and then we'll, we'll get going. Seems like we've got everybody who's in the waiting room at the moment. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on day three of Food for All. Um, I'm really excited for today. Today is uh, skills building. So we have five sessions built around um, advocacy, talking to decision makers, um, you know, just really building your skills as a constituent advocate or if you're a nonprofit uh, person, you know, your, your organization's ability to advocate. So I'm really excited about this session and just want to welcome everyone. Um, before we get going, um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Spencer Moss. I'm the executive director of the West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition. We are a member of the Food for All Coalition, which is a group of a whole bunch of organizations that care about food uh, access and food security policy. And we work together uh, to, to move policies forward at the state level with some of the delegates on the screen here um, to try to make West Virginia a more food equitable place. Um, so welcome, welcome. I'm going to kick this over to Austin Sussman from 84 Agency. He's going to give us just a really quick tech talk before we get started. And then we will just jump right into the session this morning. Thank you guys for being here. Hi, everyone. As Spencer said, I'm Austin Sussman from 84 Agency. We are so excited to be here today providing tech support for this uh, for this meeting. Um, I do want to remind everyone, uh, if you are not one of our panelists, uh, we ask that you keep your microphone muted and your camera turned off. Uh, you are welcome to ask questions for the panelists in the chat. Uh, and if, uh, the, if the session lead calls on you to ask your question, uh, using your camera and microphone, go ahead and, and you know, turn those on uh, at that time. But otherwise, we just ask that you keep the camera and microphone turned off so we can focus on, on our presenters. Uh, we do have the ability to block anyone out of the meeting if anything untoward should arise. So definitely keep that in mind. Uh, also, for those of you joining us through Facebook Live, we do, have someone mod, uh, we do have someone watching those Facebook comments. So if you have a question and you're watching on Facebook Live, feel free to put that in the comments and we uh, will see those. Um, so, and uh, lastly, like I said, myself uh, and my colleague Cam are here providing tech support. So if at any point during the meeting you have a, a, an issue, go ahead and ask either myself or Cam in the Zoom chat and we will assist you to the best of our abilities. Uh, now I will turn it back over to Spencer. Actually, um, let's go ahead and turn it on over to Seth as the session lead this morning. Thank you so much, Spencer. Um, thank you so much, 84 Agency. My name is Seth DiStefano. I am the Policy Outreach Director for the West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy. Um, I spend a lot of time down at the Capitol um, working with lawmakers and um, also working with folks who, who want to interact with their lawmakers. Probably uh, my favorite part of my work um, is supporting folks, um, communicating with their, their delegations down at the Capitol on what they think is important. Um, we are very fortunate to be joined by um, three members of the state legislature who um, are very, very serious about interacting 
um, and, and communicating with their constituents. And so what we want to accomplish today um, is to talk a little bit about the fundamental mechanics of what makes a good meeting, um, how to really get your point across, and, and what lawmakers really look for um, to, to have these productive sessions. Um, and so with that in mind, we're going to start off with some quick introductions. Um, and um, we'd like to start with the founder of the House Hunger Caucus um, from Cabell County, Delegate Chad Lovejoy, if you would please introduce yourself. Uh, thanks, Seth. Good morning, everybody. My name is Chad Lovejoy. Uh, I am uh, in the House. I've uh, been there two terms. I represent Cabell, part of Cabell and part of Wayne Counties. And uh, I'm really honored to be here with my colleagues, uh, Delegate Dean, Delegate Brown, and also a lot of my heroes uh, fighting food insecurity uh, uh, in West Virginia, like, like uh, all of you. So thanks for having me, and I look forward to a good discussion with everybody today. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Delegate Dean, would you please introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Mark Dean. I live in Mingo County. I represent parts of Mingo, McDowell, and Wyoming. Uh, I've been in there two terms along with Chad and uh, was a school principal for 15 years. That's why this is really important to me. And thank you so much for being here. Um, Delegate Brown, would you quickly introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thanks, Seth. Um, I'm Sammy Brown. I uh, currently represent the 65th District. I'm wrapping up um, my term uh, when I was elected here in 2018. Um, I think maybe uh, the, the best way that I can describe my passion around these particular issues uh, around food insecurity and the safety net and, and really speaking to why these issues are so uh, relevant and, and prevalent for the three of us is because I came from a family that had very little and, uh, and I saw what it was like and how expensive poverty uh, truly is. So um, in my time as delegate, I, I really looked to uh, perpetuate and champion policies that were around equity and justice. And I had two amazing friends and colleagues that also saw a similar vision. So uh, I'm excited to really delve into this conversation and also very grateful for the champions that are on this call, like yourself, Seth, and then Spencer, who I'm a huge fan of, by the way, by the by. <laughs> And thank you for being here um, and thank you all three of you for uh, making time um, during what I guarantee is just kind of a, a very interesting time for all of us to make time for for everything we need to make time for. Um, we will go ahead and get started. We have a couple predetermined questions um, we'd like to ask our panelists. Um, the first question uh, really is, you know, thinking not just about food security, but really any issue um, you've dealt with at the legislature. Um, what's the best meeting you've ever taken, you know, with a constituent or someone trying to educate the way you were thinking on an issue? Uh, and what, what did they do um, that made it so effective? Um, and so with that, we're going to keep the same order um, as before. We're going to start with Delegate Chad Lovejoy. Thanks, Seth. Of course, I couldn't boil it to one, so I had three, but they have similar uh, uh, high points that I think maybe we could take away. Um, the first one was probably my first week at the Capitol. It was a mother uh, of a developmentally disabled adult son who came to me to talk about the IDB waiver wait list and what it would mean to her son if we didn't get that uh, funded. The second was somebody who probably a lot of folks know on here, Rusty Williams, who came to me uh, advocating on medical cannabis. And uh, the third one, I don't know if she's on here, but Jenny Anderson, uh, who came to me about um, uh, the shared table idea. And the thing that those three meetings and the reason they stick out for me over these four years is they came to me and it was very specific. I mean, we can talk the abstracts and I think that's, you know, obviously that's the big 80 or 30,000 foot view picture, but they came with, let me tell you how this particular policy issue affects my son, how it affects me, how it affects the children in your district. And so for me, I mean, you, you can't assume, in fact, you should absolutely not assume that, that legislators uh, are educated and, and come with a knowledge of your, of your particular subject area. I, I learned 
if I learned anything during my time in the office, it's how little I know <laughs> uh, every day. It's I learn every day about about a lot. And so I didn't know all the ins and outs of those three particular issues of, of the medical cannabis, the IBD waiver and the food insecurity. So so when these people came to me, they, they came with an open mind, an open heart. They educated me. They said, let me explain to you the issue. You may not know, and I did not. Let me explain to you how it affects me, my, my loved ones, my families, uh, members, and then let me give you, I think importantly, some solutions. Um, this is why this particular decision or uh, vote would positively impact me and my family. And so for me, I'm, I was able through those meetings to move from this abstract. Well, of course I wanna help people. Of course I want to help fight hunger. Uh, but, but here is somebody coming to me with a, a specific policy piece that allowed me to put it into action. They educated me on it. And uh, so for me, uh, I would say, keep it real. I mean, you know, come in with specifics, come in with, um, uh, with, with an understanding that this is so important to you, but the person you're talking to probably doesn't understand it a tenth of how you understand it. So be patient, be willing to teach, be willing to share, and be vulnerable. Because when those people did that with me, it, it softened me to a place where I thought, well, gosh, I have to do something to help these people because they have shared with me uh, that, that there's suffering going on that I am in a position to maybe help with. So those are the things that for me, um, you know, it's kind of what your, your, your parents or your teachers, people take, be yourself. Uh, it's so much better than coming in as a policy wonk at times when you can come in and disarm a person, teach them and show them how to help. And I think many, many times when you do that, you'll have positive results. Very thoughtful feedback. Thank you so much. Delegate Dean, would you care to go next, please? We may have lost Delegate Dean. He was having some internet connectivity issues. Um, still see him there. Tell you what, Sammy, will you follow up while we um, figure that out? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I've been on both sides of this equation, uh, first as an organizer and an advocate, but then after uh, elected, uh, I, I was elected in 2018, then I, uh, you know, became the legislator, I became uh, the elected official. And so the conversations, or at least the positioning in the conversation, uh, it, it felt, it, it came full circle for me. I can tell you in both one, uh, that the issue was one that was very much aligned with my values. And then I had an organization that uh, at first blush, we, we couldn't be further apart. In both cases, um, the conversation I could genuinely break it down into three components, which is your value-based or how you're driven, um, the, the heartstrings that are being pulled in this particular policy. So when you're talking about your values, I would say then your policy component, and then of course being solution-based. And when I approach these conversations, I like to break it down in those three ways. Um, I think Chad actually articulated this very well, that when you lead with your values and why this personally impacts you, your family, your friends, your neighbors, and how this uh, collectively impacts us all, um, it helps for me as the elected to be able to visualize what I can do as far as that policy and how I can do some good here. Now, when I start to craft that policy though, if I don't know our end game, what we're trying to solve here, it, it kind of, it, you can put language forward that, that has the top lines that, that says all the right things, or you can be someone that likes to impact policy that really makes change, that actually gets to the heart of the issue and what is the opportunity. And, and solve the problem. Um, so uh, when we're thinking about, uh, particularly when you're approaching the conversation and you're going in and you're very passionate about your issue, yes, very much be open-minded and speak from the heart. Um, but then also when you're crafting your own personal or internal strategy, think about what is the problem I'm trying to solve and uh, allow for us to collaborate on that end game. I think it works really well. It also uh, has lent itself to um, 
bipartisan conversation and bipartisan collaboration. Uh, and I think that's incredibly important right now in a time that feels divisive, um, but we ultimately have the people of West Virginia that we need to protect and, and serve. Excellent feedback, and I couldn't uh, agree more, especially on issues of food security. I don't know that there's a, a West Virginia value um, that is more universal and across the board that I've noticed um, <clears throat> but around the capital and across the state. As I as I like to tell people, the first two questions you're going to get upon entering any West Virginian's home um, almost certainly are: um, Are you hungry, and would you like something to eat? It's almost it's almost <laughs> universal. Um, Randolph County, Cabell County, Jefferson County, Mingo County, you name it. Um, so it's it's pretty much the kind of what we we think about, and so leading with those fundamental values are, are incredibly important. Thank you for that. Dele it's Delegate Dean, cool. yeah, Delegate Dean, would you care to weigh in on that? No. I don't know if we lost Mark or not. One second here. Okay, um, we will give our tech support team um, a minute or two. Hey, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, Delegate Dean, how you doing? I'm doing well. I, I was connected by phone. Something's going on with my internet here at the office. I apologize. Uh, no just to kind of echo what my colleagues said, I don't really have any specific meetings, but it's so, so important to remember when you come to talk to us, you have a 134 legislators there and we all come from different backgrounds that when you come to talk to us about stuff it ha has solutions for us has specifics uh it comes to us with passion like, like chad said one meeting I'll, I'll always remember is he's became a friend of mine now but was when rusty williams first came to my office to talk to me about medical cannabis uh, i was already a supporter but hearing it from rusty also gave me some things that i needed to know be able to tell other people that were on the fence about it so so you guys educate us a, a whole, whole lot. Don't assume that we ha are sitting up there with all the solutions. Great point. Um, and um, to that point, I, th I think that um, Delegate Dean um, reinforces something that is incredibly important. A couple of things that are incredibly important that we all need to remember. Um, our legislature is um, a part-time legislature, um, which is to say that all lawmakers in Charleston have full-time lives outside of the legislature, right? They have families, they have jobs, they have you know, community involvement that that is on top of their legislative service. So, you know, making sure that you're bringing, you know, solutions to the table and you're bringing that patience to educate um, and, and not assuming that they know as as much as you do about the issues that 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 you care about. And, you know, I think that's a good place, a great place to start. Um, Delegate Dean also reinforced um, something that I think is incredibly important um, in the role of those who are personally impacted by policy. Um, really taking a front and center approach. Um, and I, you know, if Rusty, if you're out there, um, big kudos to you for everything you have done on this issue um, of medical cannabis. And one of the reasons that has been so incredibly successful um, is, is Rusty's personal experience um, with this. I mean, I, I think that there's probably no other pivot. I mean, there's a lot of people who've been involved in this, but I can't think of anyone who has been more important than Rusty. And the reason I think Rusty has been so important is because he's personally impacted by the issue. Um, that really um, so, you know, when we're working on these issues, it is incredibly important um, to get away from your, you know, your, your standard lobbyists, people like me, make sure you're bringing in people um, who are directly impacted by hunger, directly impacted by healthcare and all these issues and make sure they are front and center um, talking with lawmakers. Um, we're going to move to our second predetermined question. Um, there have been um, a couple trial balloons kind of put out there and some public statements um, about inevitable changes um, to the legislative process because of COVID-19. Um, and I think that this is something that a lot of people are thinking about. Um, what, what's your advice um, for your constituents and folks out there um, who, who really um, want to make sure that the people have access to the people's business during a legislative session? You know, granted, we have to take precautions and we need to make sure we, we look out for the safety and control of the spread as much as we can. We also want a legislature that's accessible and transparent. Um, and so um, what would your advice be on, on, you know, what, what can folks do to kind of, you know, make sure that ahead of the session, um, those, you know, those concerns are addressed and, and heard. Sammy, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, I think probably the best way 
um, is to leverage uh, these spaces like we're doing today. So we're we're broadcasting live on Zoom. Uh, something that I, I did a lot of uh, in my first session was I would go live. I you know I would have a lot of interactive calls. Um, to make sure that folks could give me feedback in real time. Some of it good, some of it bad. <laughs> but either way, I was very much exposed to, um, to the general consensus of, of our respective communities. It really opened me up uh, to the feedback of the state overall. And it was a, it was a true temp check. As constituents, uh, and on that side being proactive, there, there are emails, right? And I would mind, uh, remind folks that keep them concise, uh, you know, if you can bullet point them to like really flesh out three to five points um, to get right to the heart of what you need your legislator to do to serve you, that's great. But also scheduling that time so that we can have these types of interactive calls. If, if you want to make sure that there's a 15, 20, 30 minute call that you can do, um, so that you can interact with your with your elected. That's probably the best way to kick it right now. Also, um, on the again, on the flip side of things, when I was uh, on the advocacy side, I mean, I was constantly streaming session. I was streaming um, our committee meetings. And then, of course, that served me well as an elected and then serving on, on the committee on judiciary. Um, being proactive and educating yourself and leveraging the fact that all of this is publicly accessible at this point allows for you to come to the conversation with such a breadth of knowledge uh, that allows for you to be truly interactive and proactive in your conversations. Um, so just to break it down again, schedule that time with your legislator. Um, if you're going to do the email route, again, flag the top if it's urgent and then uh, keep your bullet points to three to five so your legislator knows how exactly you they need to serve you and then uh, leverage the space that we have online to make sure that you're streaming um, any session and uh, committee meetings. So you can also use that as part of your strategic planning. Good advice, um, good concise advice as well. I'm uh, reinforce keeping those emails tight, right? You know, um, our lawmakers get thousands um, of email communications um, and if you you know if you if you provide a dissertation um, in an email it, it makes it a little bit more difficult on them so I just you know a little bit of you know kind of tricks of the trade keep those bullet points tight and you know communicate effectively delegate Dean would you um would you care to follow up on that um with the the would you just care to go next sure I'm, I'm not sure exactly how much I can add that's pretty much it uh <laughs> With the emails, it is really important to make sure and keep those concise. We literally can get thousands a day, especially when there's heated things going on. Uh, everything now is publicly accessible. You can see where every, almost every dollar in the state spent, all of our meetings are live streamed. I encourage people just to stay active and, and stay knowledgeable and ask lots and lots of questions. Uh, I'm sure there's no way that we agree with every constituent in our districts, but we represent all of them. So we should be willing to sit down and, and answer those tough questions that they have. Thank you for that. Um, and Delegate Dean brings up a, a good point about the um, introduction of the live stream committee meetings and the live stream floor sessions, um, you know, two uh, elements of the legislative process that have been introduced within the past couple of years. Um, and, and two elements I have to I have to say have increased participation and knowledge of the process um, exponentially, um, bringing those things out into the light. Um, so folks can un kind of understand, like, you know, what do you mean second reading of the bill? Oh, that's what you mean. That's when you get to amend a bill. Or what do you, you know, what does this motion mean or that motion mean? And for folks um, out there um, watching, if you go to wvlegislature.gov, um, there is um, pretty clearly outlined where you can live stream um, both either through video or through just um, regular, um, you know, audio. You, you can do that. And hopefully that'll continue uh, and, and hopefully leadership is thinking about ways to kind of expand access um, to, to that as well. I mean, that is a, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. That's a, that's a great point, Delegate. Um, Delegate Lovejoy? Um, I guess I would say cultivating the relationships, both individually and collectively, is, is probably the key to this whole discussion for me. Um, you know, you start with, you live somewhere in West Virginia, so you have at least a delegate, maybe up to five, you have two senators, right? Um, and so, you know, figure out who they are 
And if you don't already have a relationship, you know, even if you just reach out by one of these emails, I think when we hear from constituents, that kind of like you get a little, um, I don't want to say a red flag, but, you know, politicians to some extent are, are creatures of preservation. And so it's like, oh, this is somebody that lives in my district as a voter. And so when you say, hey, I'm, I'm so-and-so and I live in your district and food insecurity is really important to me, uh, I have a couple of things I want to bring up. And as the session goes on, I'd love to be able to reach out to you if I see something. And most of the representatives probably would say, sure. I mean, you may get some that, that don't, but I think most people would probably receive that well. And you've kind of begun a dialogue. Second thing I would say is get to know a little bit about, and this is where you can you know, tap into coalitions and people to figure out kind of what are the primary uh, principles maybe of your particular legislator. I think that's very important. I learned long ago as a young trial lawyer that it's very hard to go in and change people's core beliefs on a jury. Instead, what I have to do is convince the people on the jury that the result that I want is consistent with their core beliefs, right? I'm not going to change them. And so you'll remember, Seth, when we were dealing with like um, uh, some of the, um, uh, the felony ban on SNAP benefits that, that, that we discussed to the evangelical uh, folks, the reconciliation of corporal works of mercy of feeding the hungry as as uh, a required activity of your Christian faith. And so, yeah, again, we went in and tried to say, no, what we're, we're not trying to change. We're showing you that what we're asking you to do is what you say you're about. And so learn a little bit about your people. Don't just assume if they're a different party than you or they have a different maybe reputation than you may like. Uh, don't just assume they're going to you know, lock you out. And so try to get to know them, build the relationship and be able. The second thing I would say is the, the group, the collective relationship, uh, because we're not going to probably be meeting in the same way as we have in the past sessions um, for issues of food insecurity. I mean, there's a reason it's called the coalition. And that's because it is a group of people that have um, uh, aligned principles that work together to achieve goals. And so if, if it's issues of food insecurity, we may not be able to have everybody there that has an interest. I, pr I promise you we won't, but I promise you that, that, that the folks on this call will have the ears of, of at least a few legislators, if not all of them, and we will work with you. So working with your coalitions, I think will be really even more important than ever in the upcoming session. Great point. Um, all, all great points. Um, thank you for that, Delegate Lovejoy, um, especially the point about working in coalition. Um, I think one of the things I'm, I'm most proud um, of, of this coalition um, is our ability, um, not only our ability, but our, our diversity of thought um, and our ability to um, set other potential differences aside and focus on, on one um, singular, not singular issue, but one kind of subset of policy issues around food insecurity. Um, and so I think that you make a great point um, in that bringing as many diversified voices to the table um, to really push on one area of policy is, is a great way to kind of navigate um, the potential changes um, that we are, are going to be seeing in an upcoming session. Because you know ultimately, if somebody can't break through, then another member of the coalition potentially can. Um, so with that, um, we are going to open it up with questions. Um, and in that, I'd like to ask Angie um, to unmute and, and ask her question about visual aids. Angie, you out there? Um, I think Angie might be having some technical difficulties. Um, so I will go ahead and ask this. What kind of visual aid, This because this is really important. This is this is something that I've, I've noticed is, is very important to help um, members of the legislature grasp issues. What kind of visual aids or information um, do you recommend people leave um, at a meeting? Um, what, what kind of these things are most helpful? Um, Delegate Neen, would you care to, to kick us off? Yes, uh, I like numbers. I like seeing anything where we can see the actual number impact. When, when you're there talking to us is when we get the personal impact of it. When you leave us, I, I like to be left with data that I can look at. Very good point. Sammy, would you care to follow up? 
Sure. Um, I tend to be uh, visually impacted. I think that a lot of folks are, um, and in organizing in general, um, information that's quickly shareable and, uh, and visually impactful uh, tends to be what gets the most traction and goes viral online. So that's where people are, are genuinely, um, you know, starting to break things down and, um, and, and, foresee that as a, a resource of their information. So for me personally, if you have an infographic or if there's something that is, uh, I call it snackable, but I mean, if it's, if it's short, concise, and then like has your, your components uh, broken down in that way, it helps me. It also helps uh, to share and, and distribute that information, uh, not only to my colleagues, but then folks as a whole. Um, part of this too, and the way that we are very persuasive as legislators is there's more of you than there are of us. And so when you are able to impact uh, a collective uh, to really get on board with that issue, it's, it's a, it, we're, we're definitely able to speak to values a little bit more on the House floor, and I'd argue over uh, our friends in the Senate as well, when you can say your constituents uh, love this too. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, infographic and uh, I would say captivating visuals in that way are really, really great these days to work with. Delegate Lovejoy, do you have anything to add? Well, I, I, I say the same thing. I mean, I, I've been shocked at how much information we get. I mean, we may go in in a 10 hour day and bounce between, I mean, it would not be a, an exaggeration to say 50 subject pieces, whether it's tax education, you know, criminal justice. I mean, you're just, you're bouncing. And so you have to have something that is distilled and, and like both, both Mark and Sammy said, something that's kind of even if we can get it to a page. I mean, I get some people that bring books, but I, I frankly, I don't know that I, I don't have enough time sometimes in, in the period that I have to be able to get through all that. So, so executive summaries, um, you know, something that's captivating that I can look at and easily understand is, is key to be able to quickly process and try to take action. Mm -hmm. And to both of my colleagues point to Seth and, and maybe it helps to lift this up. We don't have personal staff. That's that's just not something that we have in the West Virginia legislature, um, particularly if you're not leadership. So um, we're very much taking this on ourselves and depending on the committees that you're on, I mean, there is a pretty heavy uh, workload outside of the time that you're on the floor or in committee. It was nothing for me to be up until one o'clock in the morning uh, studying bills, trying to contact folks back home and, and see if there was additional information I could grab to, you know, really make the best case possible. Um, you know, I would answer text messages on the House floor um, because that's when, when constituents could reach me. And uh, it got to the point where I, I told people to do so because I'm not at my desk. I'm, if, if I'm serving you the way that you need me to, I'm literally running all over the place. And I know that was the same for both Chad and Mark. So um, the reality is uh, we're, we're learning, uh, distributing and defending these policies on the go constantly. Great points all. Um, just one thing I would add about um, when, you're, when you're doing leave behinds and whether they're visual aids, um, whether they're um, more like, you know, position policy papers or both, um, be sure to include good, strong footnotes um, for lawmakers so they can check up on, you know, that, you know, we need to be thankful um, for lawmakers who do their own research and do their own follow up. Um, and so when you when you provide these resources for lawmakers, don't just hand them a sheet of paper with a bar graph on it. Um, make sure that you, you know, you have the ability to point out and, you know, want to give a big shout out to my colleague, Sean O'Leary, who takes care of this for me. <laughs> on, on those, make sure that you provide not only, you know, those resources, um, but make sure you provide access to, you know, where these resources are coming from, where the numbers are coming from. Um, so, so that, you know, delegates like the, the ones we have here on the call today um, and senators and, and others up at the legislature um, know that, that they, you know, they can check up on what you're saying. Um, and, and, you know, we should always be thankful for all lawmakers um, who take the time to do their own research. Um, and I think that we have three on the call today that do, and I appreciate that. So, um, Spencer, would you care to um, unmute and ask your question? 
Yeah, good morning, guys. Um, so my question for everyone is, so when we approach a lawmaker and we're, you know, I'm always talking about ag issues most of the time, um, what's a good way to sort of quickly assess how much knowledge base the lawmaker has on the issue? The last thing I want to do is talk down to somebody, but I also don't want to talk over anybody's head. And I know as a novice advocate, I definitely talked over a lot of folks' heads. So what advice do you have for sort of quickly assessing that? I, I can chime in, Seth, if that's okay. Um, so for uh, just to jump right into it, Spencer, um, same, me too. I've made that mistake, uh, not only as an advocate, but even as a legislator, it's something that you, um, I've, I've learned that I'm assuming that there is a, a set of facts and a breadth of knowledge that maybe isn't fair to begin with. Um, one of the more glaring moments that I can think of is recently uh, speaking about inequities and uh, talking about social justice and racial justice and how that impacts things like um, economic development, uh, food inequity. Um, I, I could go on genuinely, but when I would discuss these things and I would use the terms implicit bias, I, I mean, I, it was amazing that I got attacked uh, because the way that they they felt the, to, the term actually meant was reverse racism. So I, I'm automatically projecting a hate towards uh, folks that do not look or sound like, like me. Um, that might, for, for those of us that are advocates on the call and have been working in these spaces for a long time, um, that might blow your mind, but it, in earnest, that's actually common. And so what I've found um, not only as uh, a, a legislator, but then working back uh, to the advocacy space, the best way uh, to really gauge a breadth of knowledge or even um, like experiences so that folks can draw from it, even if they aren't attuned to the policy, but maybe can relate um, to how the policy could impact them or how it could have alleviated uh, that type of um, struggle in their past is uh, developing the relationship. So asking open and leading questions that uh, really delve into the personality of the legislator, uh, their lived experience. That also comes with a little bit of, of work before you get there. So really learning about the, the policies that they've introduced so far, uh, kind of drawing out the commonalities. Are they someone that is into criminal justice reform and justice space, or are they someone that uh, tends to work from, I don't know, maybe, uh, a faith-based perspective, or are, do they have a, a an acuity for the arts? So you can see kind of like the um, the themes in in the way that we represent our policies or project our policies or the things that we introduce on a regular basis. And it's not intrusive to ask, "How did you get there?" or "Why?" And so when you can draw out that type of uh, information, you can also start to piece together um, a a way to create a friendship, create a bond, and then also um, really speak to, okay, since you had this lived experience, let me tell you how this policy could have impacted that. And it really helps to, to draw those lines. I hope that helps. <laughs> I'll chime in as well there, Seth, if you don't mind. Please, please do. I, I, I think uh, we've, we've all talked about how busy and how pulled a hundred different directions we are I think to her question a lot of times it's the most effective just to say hey how familiar are you with this subject and, and just start the conversation that way I think most of the time people will be honest there's there's a handful of people there who think they know everything about everything but for the most part you'll have people who will respond honestly and that way you know where to start your conversation Seth I think that I love what Mark said and I was good I wrote down Sometimes just ask, just say, this is something that's really important to me, but I don't know your familiarity with it. I always like that tying it back to the constituent saying, you know, food insecurity, you know, has this, this is the rate in your district or your county. And so it's a real passion of mine. I want to share with you, but I don't know where you are on the spectrum of, of, of knowledge. 
And I think Mark's right. Most people say, well, I, I certainly have less than you. So I, I'd love to hear it. And, and uh, so you ask, the second is, is pre-vetting. So, you know, if you're going to approach your legislators about food insecurity, again, you talk to members of the coalition. I mean, I saw on there a minute ago, I was flipping through, I saw Liz and I saw Rick um, and I saw Josh. And so you have a lot of people who, who really know uh, probably where people are in the legislature. I mean, you have new people, which is going to be a, a learning curve. But if you were to say, look, I want to go talk to my legislator, it's delegate so-and-so, how does she approach food insecurity? And, and your coalition may say, well, you know, we've had some really good discussions. Uh, maybe, maybe she represents a very rural district. And so the, the economic side of, of the farming is very important to her. And so you can, you can come in with some knowledge, know your audience. And the coalition, again, is an important resource to the extent they have been able to, to have interactions in the past to build a frame of reference of, of what may move a particular legislator. Outstanding points, one and all. Um, thank you so much for those. And just one thing I also wanted to kind of reiterate because it kind of popped into my head a little bit. Um, don't don't you know? Don't ever assume that a legislature knows a bill that their name may be on as a sponsor backwards and forwards. Um, so um, if you know if if you if you see you know your your lawmaker's name as a co-sponsor on a bill, um, understand that they are confronted with thousands of bills um, throughout the course of a legislative session. Um, you know, sometimes they just, you know, they may not know um, what paragraph 27, um, sentence three, um, me, no, they may not know what you know about that, right? And so I think it's always good to, you know, in, in addition to what our, our, our panelists have talked about, just, you know, be upfront and ask them, hey, do you, you know, what's your knowledge level of this? Um, when you're describing bills or, you know, if the bills of concern or if you're, if you're wanting someone to sign on to a bill, understanding that, you know, you're probably starting at a level of expertise that might be a little bit more um, than what your your lawmaker is um, has, and that's just not because they're uninterested, it's because there is a, an avalanche of information. As Delegate Lovejoy said um, previously, in a, a given 10-hour day, um, the number of issues um, confronted um, by by members of the legislature is is vast. Um, so let's go back to the chat here. Um, let's see here. Josh, could you um, unmute and ask your question about delegate to delegate education? Yes, thanks, Seth, and hi, everyone. Um, my question is, for example, trying to educate um, beyond my five uh, 51st district delegates here. How do I go about, you know, having a delegate that's not from my district listening to me? And I know you all's time in terms of educating others is also limited. So where, when does that happen? Is that committee? Is that hallway back, you know, conversation between meetings? Just speaking a little bit about how we spread the education around with your colleagues. I can, I can start that a little bit. Awesome. Uh, I, I think it's important. I think an easy way to do that is, is to talk to your representatives, your delegates, and see people that they have good relationships with, and then they can point you in a place that, hey, you may need to go talk to this person, they're on the fence, or that you may not need to bother talking to this person, just say hello to them. Start with the people that you already know and kind of branch out from there. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, we, we all have our, um, our, our networks, I would say, and then you know, the folks that are very much our allies and our friends. And uh, I, th I think the best way to approach that is uh, to kind of work within the network and then branch out. There's always like a six degrees of separation. So, um, you know, if Mark's down the hall for me, three doors, and we talk about Foo Fighters on Mondays, <laughs> then uh, we, we already have a bond, but then, um, you know, who does Mark know that maybe I don't? And it, it kind of works its way around the Capitol to, to be able to have a warm lead, if you will, by word of mouth. I agree. I mean, I, you know, it's, I have four kids and I've always told them that relationships are probably the most important thing you can cultivate in your life for your own success, but also to make your life meaningful. And so, um, 
you know, real genuine relationships. And so it's hard if you're from, say you're up in Mon County, Josh, and, and you're trying to grab someone from, from Monroe County in the hall. And, and, you know, it's a very impassioned plea and it's very important, but sometimes, you know, it's not to that point yet of the relationship. So working, starting with your base and going outward and then continually building the base because, you know, so many like you, Josh, you're, you're a subject matter expert. I mean, you are, you are, you know, the, the pinnacle of food policy in knowledge. And it's just, it's, that's the, one of the things we try to do with the hunger caucus is, is getting people like you down, getting delegates. say, okay, I remember that's the guy that spoke. And so, you know, even if I don't have a geographic or a personal relationship with you, I have a preordained respect for your subject matter knowledge and that will help but it will take time. I mean, you know, Seth, we met in the hall one day and over a course of years have, have developed a real meaningful friendship. And, you know, it doesn't happen in one day, two days. It's when you go through three or four fights and you lay in the trenches and you win and you lose and you battle and then, you know, you build things. So this is, this is, a, this is a process that, you know, uh, that's what I hope the people that are watching, you know, wherever you are in the process, maybe you haven't started, maybe you've been doing it for 30 years, but, keep in the process because it will it will pay dividends hopefully in policy victories but if not you know in in meaningful i mean you're meaningfully interacting with your government to make things better and in the end that's about all you can do excellent points um and thank you so much uh, thank you all of you for that's you know very important information um for for everyone thank you so much for being um, so upfront and honest on that question and and so many others um, Margie Steltzer um, would like to invite um, Margie to unmute and um, ask her question. Um, yeah, I um, heard you talking about emails and, and looking through those. And I'm wondering if um, uh, like your email box gets so jammed, it's hard for you to sift through that and that if a, a written postcard or a written letter has any different impact. someone that believes in multiple touches. So, um, you know, especially if you're passionate about your issue, phone call, email, and the letter, uh, you know, it might seem like it's overkill, but I, I promise you it's not um, because there's no way that we're getting to see all three. But depending on where we are in our day, um, we might be able to pick up one. So I, I think that, you um, you know, the, the more touches, the better. I, I do love a note left on my desk. I live for it. Um, I've kept them all, by the way. <laughs> but um, the, the reality is the more spaces that you can cover um, to make sure that we're top of mind for you, it definitely, um, it, it does not hurt. I'll say that. I'll kind of follow up on what Sammy said. I have a disk drawer full of handwritten letters and notes that I've saved. I've never printed off an email and saved it. <laughs> for, for me, I like the email only because, you know, like I have it here and it's so it's, it's constantly at my hand, you know, we're, we're part time and we have no staff and we're not in our office. I mean, we don't really go up there and sit in the office. It's like you get there and you run around. And so you might have, you might run through and eat a granola bar and grab a, a water and then run. And then I might not be back in there for two days and there's a stack. And so sometimes if you need to get me quickly, then I always say, you know, I give everybody my cell phone, call me, text me. I check emails like all the time because, you know, I, I'm constantly doing that. So functionally, I like email, but whatever you do, and I, and I like a card too, I mean, especially if you're there in person. I love when people leave and say, hey, I stopped by to see you, but I always say, man, if you would have told me you were coming, I would have made sure to come here or stop through or tell you I had a lunch break or whatever. Um, but whatever it is, personalize it. The one thing, sometimes you get these, these auto Oh, I hate those. <laughs> yeah, those, those, I mean, it's, I get it. It's nice, you know, but I'll be honest. Sometimes I go through them and I look for ones that are from my district and, and make sure to make sure I call them back. Um, but when the personal, it's the same thing to the, the answer to the first question, that personalization that, hey, this is something that's important to me. And you can almost tell if they're writing you or if they're just sending the same one to all 100. And again, it's not that it's any less important, but it may be less impactful. I, I will tell you, it is not less important, but I can see in the subject line, yay or nay, 
right? And so if there's something of substance that you need me to grab a hold of, and it's one of those canned emails, uh, there's, there's no way we get to see it. So that's why I'm saying, you know, really pare down that pitch to three to five points. And uh, I love when folks are like Delegate Brown, um, just need a few minutes of your time or, uh, and also let me know how I can reach back out to you. Uh, there's so many times that I've gotten correspondence that I, I have no way to call you back, right? And, and if you want to keep doing this email exchange, I, we, we won't get to, but if I can call you back or text you um, while, again, I'm running between chambers trying to work a bill <laughs> or running up to a committee or whatever the case may be, I'm happy to do it. But I, I'm positive for that the three of us and then all of our colleagues in either chamber, um, you know, cover, cover your spaces, but then also um, make sure that uh, that plea is very much from you, your community, and, and why you're heart driven for that particular issue. There's a lot of issues out there that have lots and lots of money behind them. And uh, unless you're really being organic in how you're positioning for, uh, for us, it's going to get lost in, in the, the money made swampiness of politics right now. <laughs> Sorry to get a little in your face on that one. Oh, oh, quite all right. Um, quite all right. I'm just as someone who has been, um, you know, someone who has written hundreds of handwritten letters, um, and just more to um, some of the points from the previous question, this is a really great way, number one, to say thank you um, to, you know, a lawmaker who has, um, you know, stood up on an issue that you care about. Um, and it's also um, a great way to kind of introduce yourself um, to your lawmakers, um, to Delegate Dean's point. Um, you know, not printing off emails. Um, I am personally action networked into the ground. Um, you know, I, I think that I, I think just about everybody is at this point um, kind of falling back on, you know, we, when we, you know, when we ask um, coalitions for, for emails and we ask people for support, we always make sure we ask people to make it as personal as possible. Um, so it just doesn't look like an auto generated email that just pours in by the, by the thousands. So I would, um, great question, Margie. Um, and we got just uh, about 10 more minutes left. Um, and we want to um, thank you, Stephanie, for pointing this out. Um, Sela Reigns um, did want to ask, is it too soon to start reaching out to newly elected representatives? Nope. Go get them. <laughs> um, actually, uh, I, can, I can tell you uh, within the hour that I got elected, I got emails, I got phone calls, I got text messages, and it wasn't congratulations. It was Sammy Graham fix this for me. So, you know, no, it's not too soon. Go get them. And we can introduce uh, bills, what, as soon as now, really, like December, yeah. January. Is that, like, is that the consensus of the, the panelists? I think that, I think it's fair. I mean, I think once you're, once you're elected, yeah, I think that that's, that's, <laughs> that's fair to, to reach out to folks. Um, I agree. I mean, you, you know, you, you, you run and you say, this is, I want to serve. And so, you know, when you're there, I mean, you know, it, it probably is, uh, I would think it's a good thing, you know, to start cultivating those relationships and, and maybe start being the person that, you know, say, this is important to me. And when you get up there, I'd I'm going to be reaching out to you and hope we can work together because, um, because you're in a position now to help carry out this important mission of, of keeping our people uh, healthy, well, and fed. That sounded I, I think that. I think it's a great idea to go ahead and reach out to them. Lots of times when you're the new guy, this dead time between November and, and February this year, they'll they'll be appreciative of being part of the process and you reaching out to them. Awesome. Great question, um, Sila. Thank you so much. Um, so we have about seven minutes left. Um, so uh, Dr. Dr. Josh Loans um, uh, has asked the $10 million question um, coming into um, this session, um, you know, uh, we've all seen it. Um, if, you, if you're on, if you're participating in Food for All conference um, this year, um, if you're, you know, on our panel, I mean, there's just, there's no way you can avoid it. The pandemic has increased hunger um, dramatically um, throughout the state. Whether that was the abrupt cancellation of school and what free breakfast and lunch kind of means to to children throughout West Virginia, um, whether it was just the spiking unemployment, which still remains pretty high, um, or the underemployment for folks who are just not getting the hours that they used to, um, you know. Josh, would you just unmute and ask your question? I think this probably is the, 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 the big one we will end on today. 
Sure, thanks, Seth. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering what your perspective is on the mood um, going in. There are a number of new uh, delegates, I realize that, but um, just on some of your previous activism around hunger issues and how maybe it was hard to bring it down to the ground and, and reality for people. I'm thinking a lot of delegates are now in neighborhoods and you know, seeing this perhaps more firsthand than they were before due to expanding rates of food insecurity. So my hope is that it will be harder to ignore, but I'm also have a little bit of cynicism uh, going in and I'm just wondering what, what your perspective is on that. So I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, and start off. I, I think in all tragedy or in, in all negative situations, there is opportunity. And what this has done is it has exposed and laid bare many of our, um, the, the, the fragility, which we kind of know that have talked about this, but it is exposed to everyone. Uh, how fragile so many systems are. And so I agree with Josh that people are now more aware uh, because they have seen it in their communities. Um, and I think whether you know you go into broadband access or the fragile nature of our healthcare system, uh, or particularly here as we're talking about food insecurity, um, it's it's ripped whatever veneer was there and exposed it. And so we have an opportunity and, I, and I've seen just during this uh, off season, so to speak of the legislature, um, the, the summer feeding for all was our kind of big push last year. And that's kind of what happened here. I mean, we, you know, Seth, we had many, many talks about these, these plans and the busing and, and how we were gonna get food distributed to kids. So we kind of by, by we had to, by necessity, you know, delve into the practical nature of food distribution through the school system. Uh, same thing with Spencer and the SNAP, SNAP stretch. You know, we, we ran through that program so fast in the funding that we had to figure out and educate. And, and it took a while, but it got done, um, the, the importance of that program to, to um, how it works. Well, now that that education has occurred and by necessity, those, those policy pieces have moved out of the planning and the, the kind of abstract stage into, you know, food on the ground in bellies. Um, I think it'll make it better for us to be able to continue it. At least that's my hope. And I, I share some cynicism, but I'm always a little cynical, but I promise you that we'll be pushing for it. Um, and we will use this to demonstrate that this is real. This is in your district. And um, you either rise to the occasion and help people like you said you were going to do, or you don't. But but either way, you will be you will be put in the balance and weighed. And so I think it's an opportunity. I just want to take one second to give a shout out to our school service employees and the other people who volunteered at schools. I recently left the school system, but I was still the principal a principal here in Mingo County up until the middle of September. And during the summer, we were on feeding days, we were giving out 600 meals a day. I think we had a big impact on these communities. And I'm, I'm glad that we were able to put into motion some of this groundwork that Chad and Seth have laid over the last couple of years. Sam, any, any final thoughts on that? I'm not sure that I'm necessarily the right person to comment. Um, but I, I will say that uh, pandemic didn't create these issues. It exposed the issues that were already uh, plaguing West Virginia. And often when we would discuss some of these, uh, these topics and these policies, it was slanted as social issues. Um, but I would argue that uh, these are equally important for economic development, for business, for, for any other aspect that you could perceive as a, a platform point. If you are not protecting your most vulnerable, if you're not feeding those families, if we're not creating equitable spaces 
if babies are going to school with hungry bellies, they cannot learn. And so if we are going to have an economy that thrives, uh, you have to have a skilled, sober, accessible populace. And how you get that is by defending and honoring the most vulnerable of our communities. It would be a huge mistake to not take up issues like these. I don't care what party you affiliate with, a huge misstep. And the people of West Virginia will feel it if you do not. And so that is really my calling card. That's really my call to action for uh, not only those chambers, but for the, for the folks that will be watching from home. And with that, um, we are right at 1030. Um, I want to thank our panelists um, so very much, Delegate Lovejoy, um, Delegate Brown, Delegate Dean, um, for taking time out of your busy schedules um, to, to join us and the coalition partners. We had great attendance today um, and, and really looking forward um, to bringing in new coalition partners um, through this and, and taking your message and your advice on these skills um, and how to apply them to the policy making process because it is so important. Um, big thanks to Spencer Moss and the staff of the West Virginia Food and Farm Coalition um, for yet again um, pulling off an administratively organizing um, feat um, to, to make this happen this year. And we usually do this in person in a great big room where we can all sit down and talk and see one another. Um, that clearly is not an option right now. Um, and Spencer and her team did an amazing job um, pulling off what I, I have to say. I, this is not my first virtual conference in 2020, um, but it is clearly the best one I've attended and, and clearly the the best attended conference I've been to. So thank you all so much. Thank you for your questions. And don't forget um, about the, um, in, in the words of um, Josh, the smorgasbord of skill building sessions that will take place throughout the day. Um, we have a lot of great sessions, so we hope you continue to join us. Um, and with that, I will close it up.